Good evening. So I'm going to talk to you about killing um, and immune killing and try to persuade you that a little bit of killing is good for you, but too much is a bad thing, and how we're using structural biology to try to understand how the immune system kills. So this is actually a 100-year-old mystery, and it started, I guess, in 1898 with the father, one of the fathers of um, immunology, Jules Bourdais. And what he found was if he took um, blood plasma and added it to foreign cells or certain types of bacteria, something really remarkable happened. And on the right, if you watch the video, you can see, I hope, little, these little blobs disappearing. And that is cells bursting in response to the addition of um, a lytic component present in blood plasma. He won the Nobel Prize in 1921 for this work, but the actual mechanism of how these immune killing machines work has remained really mysterious up until very recently. So what do I mean by lysis? Well, the, the big black blob on the screen is a cell, and the sort of stuff spraying out of it is essentially a cell being lysed. It's being burst and the contents are emptying. So you can imagine a cell like a balloon full of water and putting a hole in it and the contents spill out. And the way the immune system does this is by punching lots of holes in cells. And so you can see on this um, slide here, I hope, all these round donut shaped things are actually holes in the cell surface. Now, the immune system is a pretty interesting machine. And it's not quite just as simple as making a big hole in a cell. Because what the immune system does is not only does it make a hole, but it actually inserts something through that hole, a toxin, which actually, even if the cell can repair itself, which it often does, the toxin's already inside the cell, and it's all too late, and the cell dies. And that's essentially a wonderful way of basically making sure that when your immune system attacks something, it really does end up dying as intended. And these class of proteins that I'm talking about today are called perforin-like proteins, and they're called perforin-like proteins because they perforate things, like cells. So you might say, why do I care about perforin-like proteins? Well, one reason, if you don't have them, you can get very, very sick. And so certain people who lack aspects of the immune system, such as the complement system, are far more susceptible to getting very, very serious bacterial infections, like, for example, bacterial meningitis or septicemia. And if you ever wake up with a rash like this on the screen, you should go to hospital very, very fast. In addition, people who lack perforin itself, which is produced by immune cells to kill virally infected and cancerous cells, Individuals who don't have perforin develop a very serious um, immunoproliferative disease, usually in the first six months of life. So these are babies, and they develop something called HLH or FLH. And basically what happens in this disease is the immune system can't kill properly. So the immune system encounters a viral infected cells and it tries to kill it, and it can't kill it. So what it does is it sends out signals to more immune cells to come along and try to kill the cell, and they can't kill it, and they send out more and more and more signals, and we end up with actually something called cytokine storm, which eventually there's so much immune activity that the immune system turns on the individual, and if untreated, they die. So the only treatment for HLH is a bone marrow transplant, which is essentially giving somebody a new immune system that does contain perforin. And just as an aside, it may interest you to know that Ebola, for example, doesn't kill you because of the Ebola virus. It's actually the cytokine storm. It's when your own immune system trying desperately to wipe out um, the Ebola virus that actually ends up um, killing you. OK, so killing is good. Killing is also bad. And in this particular slide here, we can see an individual in injecting him or herself with insulin because they're a type 1 diabetic. And the tissue damage of the cells that basically produce insulin in autoimmune diabetes is perforin-mediated. 
And so basically in this instance, this is an unwanted activity of perforin. Similarly, too much complement, Jules Bourdais discovery in blood plasma, if you don't control complement properly, you can end up again with serious diseases. And in this case, this is a disease where the complement system, the, the perforin like protein in the complement system is attacking red blood cells. And as a consequence, the cells are bursting, releasing hemoglobin, and that ends up being um, secreted in the urine. And so you get blood stained urine and eventually kidney failure and death. So we're very interested in developing inhibitors of these proteins because we think that they're going to be of use in improving the success of both solid organ and bone marrow transplantation and also in controlling the immune system in certain disease states. So how we, did we go about doing this? Well, I moved to Australia in 1997 and I met my partner, now my wife, in 1998, Michelle Dunstone. And she's a scientist as well. And we decided we wanted to work on something together. And we decided that we were going to work on trying to solve the atomic structure of a perforin-like protein. Because despite the fact that this, if you like, family of proteins have been known for over 100 years, we had no idea how they work. I'm a structural biologist, and so what I do is I, I determine the, actually the atomic structure of a protein. And the reason why that's useful and interesting is because proteins are like tiny machines. And if you can see where all the atoms are, you can start to work out how they work. And really, from a structural biology perspective, it's like turning on a light in a dark room with a machine in the middle of it and suddenly going, oh, I can see how that functions. So, we started basically, and for 10 years actually, around 10 years, we got absolutely nowhere. We tried hundreds of different things, and this is a common tale that many scientists will tell you. It takes a long time to actually um, make a breakthrough. And so we'd pretty much almost given up when a very talented postdoc um, in my lab at the time, Carlos Rosaldo, found this um, perforin-like protein in an organism called Photorhabdus luminescens. And Photorhabdus luminescens is a rather interesting bug. It's a bacteria and it infects insects. And it's, as its name suggests, it's luminescence. And so you can see on the screen here an insect larva infected with Photorhabdus and it's glowing in the dark. Now, this is a special bacteria because it produces a lot of other toxins, one of which is a perforin-like protein, but it produces a lot of other, if you like, antibiotics. We think probably to prevent other bacteria from coming along and feeding on its dinner. Once it gets into this, in its insect, it wants that all for itself. It doesn't want to give it to anything else. So it's a bacteria which produces a lot of antibiotics. And it's a very famous bacteria, because in the American Civil War, which was a, a, you know, a horrific war, people were rolling around in mud with very, very serious wounds. And those wounds sometimes got infected with Photorhabdus. And when they were infected, the wounds glowed, which you'd imagine is a pretty um, unpleasant experience for the person infected with it. But the bacteria in the wounds is producing natural antibiotics, which prevent worse bacteria, more dangerous bacteria, from getting in and colonizing the wound and then killing the individual. And so it turns out that the doctors and nurses at the time of the Civil War noticed that the people whose wounds glowed survived longer or survived, whereas those who didn't were more likely to die. And so they nicknamed it the angel's glow. But anyway, this protein has a perforin-like protein. And we were very, Carlos was able to grow crystals of this protein. And we used an instrument a little like the Australian synchrotron, but we had to go overseas for this particular, um, this particular experiment because we didn't have a synchrotron back in 2006. It was still being built. And using the synchrotron, we were able to collect a diffraction, the diffraction data needed to determine the structure. So all of the spots on the left-hand side of the screen that you see is, if you like, our raw data. And we can use that information to back calculate the position of all of the atoms in the protein in the, which is present in the crystal. Now, this, 
I first saw this data actually in the Monash Medical Center Maternity Hospital because it so happened we solved this structure at the same time as um, my, our first child was born, Charlotte. Um, this was not a problem because new babies are generally pretty sort of sleepy things, but the midwives were reasonably appalled to see myself and Michelle with computers on our lap and sort of like this child on one hand um, typing away and looking at the crystal structure. But this is what we saw. And so on the left-hand side of the screen is our structure of a perforin-like protein from um, this uh, photorabdus bacteria. And when we saw it, it was, I think, the most exciting moment of my life because we could immediately see that this wasn't a new type of pore-forming machinery at all. This was actually a very, very ancient fold that had been well studied in another system, but it's so distantly related, nobody picked it up before. So on the right is a bacterial cytolysin, which is a class of pore-forming proteins. And I hope if you look carefully at these two images, you can see they're sort of the same shape. They have that sort of bent beta, that sort of bent structure in the middle. They're quite square shaped. And for, to cut a long story short, these two proteins are related, but they're separated, they're like cousins separated by around two billion years. Now, the great thing about bacterial cytolysins is a lot's known about them. Remember, we really had no idea how a perforin-like protein formed a pore in a cell. But a group of scientists, and in particular, Helen Sable and Rod Tweeten um, in the US and Helen Sable in London, had done an enormous amount of work looking at how the cytolysins work. And they, like our immune system, cause tissue damage. So when you get a sore throat, if you've got a, a strep throat, for example, one of the reasons why you're in such pain is because there's a poor forming toxin being secreted by that bacteria, causing damage to your tissue. So, how do bacterial cytolysins work? They're like giant hole-punching machines. What happens is, they first, they bind onto the surface of the cell, and then they start to coalesce and bind to one another to form a giant ring shape, as you can see in the video here. And once they form this ring, something remarkable is going to happen. The whole assembly is going to collapse towards the membrane surface, and it's going to punch a great big hole, about 100 angstroms wide, which in biological terms is pretty big. Now, everyone always asks what happens to the bit in the middle. We don't know. It, we presume it just gets spat out into the extracellular environment. And here's this conformational change happening now. Bang. Nice big cookie cutter cutting a hole in the cell. And so this is how cytolysins work. And we, we hypothesized that the perforin-like proteins, because they have the same sort of machinery, likely work in the same way. But we're scientists, we need to test that hypothesis, and we need to demonstrate that they work in the same way. Because don't forget, these two groups of proteins are separated by a very long time indeed. So how did we do that? Well, at this point, Michelle had a stroke of genius, and she worked out that the oyster mushroom had a perforin-like protein that we felt would be useful for studying the structure of the actual pore form itself. Now, why does an oyster mushroom have a perforin-like protein? We don't really know the answer to that, but one interesting thing about oyster mushrooms is they're really nice to eat. They're great in risotto, but the mushroom actually isn't a vegetarian. The mushroom likes to eat nematodes, so this is, so for all vegetarians out there who like eating oyster mushrooms, what you're eating is actually uh, something which likes eating worms, which is cool, is how it gets its nitrogen. And here we've got a fungal hyphae, if you like, a filament, basically wrapping around the nematode and trapping it so it can basically um, use the resources within that little worm to grow um, and survive. So we think one reason that the fungi might have um, a perforin-like protein is to help it in killing its prey. So this time, again, we used a combination of the Australian synchrotron, 
We also, in collaboration with Helen Sable in London, one of the great things about being a scientist is you get to travel a lot and work with a lot of different and great people. And um, Helen's group in London used electron microscopy, a little like the instrument shown on the left here, to basically solve the pore form. We solved the crystal structures and then we put everything together. And what did we see? We could see at actually the highest resolution um, to date, the structure of a perforin-like pore in a membrane. And you can see it's this sort of giant barrel-shaped molecule with a big hole in the, in the middle, which is around 80 angstroms in diameter, which is well big enough to take a nice toxic cargo into the cytoplasm, into the cell it's trying to basically kill. Michelle went one step further, though. She also made a lot of, if you like, intermediate structures en route, which we also solved the um, structure of. So we could actually build up a molecular movie of how this protein changes in shape as it assembles on the membrane and enters the cell. So taken together, this actually gives us a picture of how perforin-like proteins function. When an immune cell encounters a virally infected cell, it first has to make sure that it is genuinely um, foreign, uh, a, 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 an infected cell rather than an, a, a, a harmless cell. It releases cytokines to bring in new um, uh, immune cells into the, in, into the action. And then it releases perforin and the toxic granzymes into the synapse. The perforin assembles into a pore, and then through the pore, the toxic granzyme molecules enter the target cell. And even if the cell manages to repair itself, it's too late because the toxin's inside and the cell dies. And the immune cell goes off to find another target and to kill that. So I guess over the last 10 years, we've gone from knowing really very, very little about how this family of pore forming proteins work to actually building a picture of how these molecules bind to, assemble on the surface of cells undergo conformational change or changes in shape, allow toxic granzymes and other um, toxins into the cell and thereby causing death. And this is now informing our drug discovery program. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>